How to spot a devilish preacher. Why is this important? Why is it important to be able to discern and to be able to distinguish the real from the fake? Why is it important to know who is of God and who isn't of God? I'll tell you why. Because deception is dangerous. For the believer to believe lies, what happens is they become confused, they become weakened, they become spiritually crippled, and they are no longer able to grow spiritually. But for the non-believer who believes falsehood, the non-believers of the world who listen to fake and false prophets and teachers and preachers of our day, they will be damned in hell forever and ever and ever. How serious is deception? It is that serious. Amen. It's a very serious matter. As I was praying, I do believe with all my heart that we are living in the very last days and that many are turning from the faith just as the Apostle Paul prophesied in 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2, we are living in the snap dab middle of the great apostasy. Churches are being filled. The name of Jesus Christ is being sung, but truth is not being taught. The word is not being honored. And men are lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. They have replaced the true Jesus with the fake Jesus. And those who don't know the word can't tell. Amen. And so I'm very glad that we're in this chapter today and in these passages. As you know, I don't get to choose what we're going to preach on. The Bible does. Amen. When you go through the Bible, you preach what the Spirit of God wants you to preach. You don't have a choice in the matter. Amen. And that's one reason why I love to preach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book. Because these are the very words of God. You get everything in context and the man can't run from any passage. Amen. And by the way, that's the correct way to read the Bible. In Matthew 23, verse 13, Jesus says this. I'm talking about the danger of deception. In fact, that was going to be the ultimate sign that we're living in the last days. Jesus said, many will come in my name, he says, and say, I am the Christ. And many, not a few, lots of people will be deceived by them. But now I'm going to tell you something. The enemy has changed his tactic in the last days. Men no longer say, I am the Christ, because we're not stupid enough to believe it. Today they say, I have the Christ. And it's a different Jesus. And we'll find out what I'm talking about in a moment. But in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 13, Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law. Now he's speaking to the, the Pharisees of his day. He says, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, he's calling these false prophets and wolves of his time actors. These are the first century false prophets. He says, you shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. How serious is deception? Jesus warned us that sincere seekers will want to know Jesus Christ, but because of the false prophets of his day and ours, they will not get to know who Jesus is and they will not enter heaven, not the teachers and not the students. That's how dangerous falsehood and anything that's contrary to the word of God really is. It is damning and it is permanent. Jesus called them hypocrites because they were pretenders. They were self-righteous. These are symptoms, by the way, and signs of a devilish preacher. They didn't teach or understand the word, the Old Testament, correctly. Instead, they avoided it and added to it, as you know, making it very hard for men, for common people to come and truly know and love and obey God. That's what false preachers do. They do not allow you to come to Jesus, know Him, love Him, and obey Him with all your heart. Because they're in the way. They love money, they love themselves, they love the praise of men, and ultimately they reject Jesus Christ. And sometimes they don't reject Him completely because of course they need to be stealth. They reject certain aspects of Him. And if you reject any part of Jesus Christ, you reject all of Christ. 
They were not men of God, although they tricked thousands into thinking they were. The Pharisees posed as godly men of their time. And the majority of Israel believed it to be so. They thought the Pharisees and the scribes and the teachers of the law and the Sadducees were the godly men of Israel, but they weren't. In fact, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and ascended to heaven, he only had 500 followers. It is said that the Pharisees, the false preachers and false teachers, had thousands of followers. The Lord said, there are only two roads. One way is narrow that leads to heaven, and one way is broad that leads to hell. And false preachers are on that broad way. In fact, they are the door to the broad way to hell. And Jesus is the door to the narrow way that Amen. leads to heaven. Amen. And they tricked them. But as you know, Jesus Christ saw right through their phony ways, and today it is no different. Timothy says, the Lord knows those who are his. The Lord knows those who are his. Listen, false and devilish preachers and teachers of our day can deceive people, but they cannot deceive God. So rejoice in that. The curse that Jesus pronounced on them was basically this. You are phonies. And because of that, you and your followers will go to hell. Devilish preachers end up in hell and bring their listeners with them through their lies. And they're not open lies most of the time. They're lies covered with truth. They're lies mixed with truth. Uh, who does that remind you of? Satan, right? Yeah. right? When he was tempting Jesus Christ in the wilderness in Matthew chapter 4, he used the word of God. But he was deceptive. He was anti-Christ. He was against Jesus. But Jesus saw right through his wicked eyes and wicked schemes. And you and I are going to be taught today to do the very same thing through the word of God. And you know what I love about John's writing is this. He is very clear. He is very precise. And he tells us exactly what to look for so that way nobody gets confused and so that way nobody has an excuse. What a wonderful God we serve. Amen? Amen. That the Spirit of God would make things very clear for the church. This way we don't have to worry, doubt, or be concerned in any way. The Lord's going to show us today, this is mine, this is not. Amen. With that said, let us open our Bibles. To 1 John, we're in chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 to 6. How to spot a devilish preacher. I'll tell you, this is not a very popular teaching in our time. John is speaking to the church, to the church in his time, and to us here today. Beloved. Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. And this is the reason why. Because many, that's loads of false prophets have gone out into the world. That's their mission field. And even the church, by the way. Verse 2. By this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. It's not saying that the Antichrist is here. It's saying his spirit is here. And that is mainly the spirit of the devil, the spirit of Satan and his demons. Verse 4, he says, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. This is why. Because he, speaking of Jesus, who is in you is greater, that is stronger, than he who is in the world, speaking of Satan. Have you ever seen that picture? It's a very popular picture where you have Satan and Jesus arm wrestling. Yeah. There is no comparison between Jesus and Satan. Jesus is stronger, better, wiser, and more powerful than that little lying snake. I'll tell you that right now. Amen. 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 Satan likes to flex. 
Satan likes to make himself look really big and really strong, but he's not. If there was a fight between the two, the Lord would be something of a swift elephant and Satan would be a crippled cockroach. There would be no chance for him. God is huge and He is in you today if you are in Christ. Five, they, speaking of the devilish preachers, speaking of false prophets, speaking of individuals who claim to know Jesus, false Christians, they are of the world. Therefore, this is why they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. He says, we are of God, speaking of himself and the apostles. He who knows God hears us. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. John begins by saying, beloved. John continues to use the word beloved and little children, which are words of endearment because he means it. He really loves those he's teaching. He really loves those he's leading. There's a deep concern for their spiritual well-being. He's also known as the apostle of love. Why? Because the whole book is about loving God and loving others. He's the apostle of love. John has a genuine love for those he teaches and those he leads. They are his brothers and sisters. They are not a means to an end. It's been said that loving shepherds smell like sheep. Wicked and devilish preachers avoid God's people at all costs and as much as possible. True shepherds are around God's people. They care for them. They weep with them. They talk to them as the people bring to them their concerns. They ought to smell like the sheep. And sometimes, church, we're all very stinky because at times we are bad. <laughs> I try to use it every once in a while and it works here and there. A friend of mine told me recently that she was going to a local church. She tried to talk to the pastor after, and he had a little entourage. Uh, he had like his little security guards. And she was saying that he was unapproachable, that she couldn't talk to him about her concerns because he was surrounded by, you know, his, his elites in the church. That is not the heart of a true shepherd. Jesus Christ would sit on a rock and allow children to sit on his lap. Amen. And anytime anyone would say, get away from him, he would say, hey, watch your mouth, Peter. Watch your mouth, Andrew. I love these children. Amen. So then a true shepherd loves, truly loves God's people. They truly love God's people. Devilish preachers, on the other hand, don't truly love the flock. You don't love the people of God. They are in it for themselves. A few years back, I heard of a pop preacher. That's what I call secular, worldly, popular preachers of our day. Was caught buying his own book with the church's money in order for him to get his book at the top of the New York bestsellers list. That is a preacher... Uh, a devilish one, by the way, who cares more about his name, more about his fame, than he cares about the church. Yeah. Amen. Very clear. The man loves himself. These are the kinds of things that we got to look out for. When we hear certain individuals doing these kinds of things, they are red flags. Red flags. And red flags are going up everywhere nowadays. We are to be, to a certain degree, apologists. And we may not be professionals at defending the faith, but we ought to be the best we can be as we know the Word of God. We ought to be able to defend the faith, especially the person, the work, and the teachings of Jesus Christ. Especially that. Amen. In John chapter 10 and verse 13, Jesus says it plainly like this. Hirelings do not care for the sheep. Those are in it for themselves. Those are in it for the money. Those are in it for the fame. They're not true shepherds. They're hirelings. When danger comes, they're going to run. They don't care about the sheep. John, on the other hand, was placed in prison because of this message to the church. True shepherds are willing to be in the front of the line when persecution comes. 
false shepherds, they will be in cahoots with the government, and they will not be persecuted. He goes on to say, do not believe every spirit. John implores them and us today to not be naive. Don't be gullible. Don't be a simpleton, but be wise. Not everyone who says they know God truly knows God. Not everyone who says they know God truly knows God. What are we looking for? Are we looking for a man who is clean cut, who's got a smile from ear to ear, who's got a big fat Bible in his hand? If that was the case, we would miss John Baptist. He was clothed with camel's hair and ate honey and locusts and he wasn't very impressive, yet he was the most powerful prophet of his day besides Jesus Amen. the Lord. Amen. So what are we looking for? Well, we're looking for lovelessness. We're looking for pride. We're looking for men who are peddling the word. We're looking for these things. And listen to me. He says, do not believe every spirit. Those who are most open to believing and falling for devilish preachers are those who are, listen to me, not familiar with the Bible. Non-Bible readers, non-Bible students, non-church going Christians are easier to be deceived. It's like when you have a pride of lions in a and a pack of gazelles, they go after the babes, they go after the young ones, the naive and gullible one. Amen. Devilish preachers prey on those who are new in the faith. They prey on the young, they prey on the immature, on the carnal, worldly Christian, on the careless. Those are their biggest targets. They know that they can go after those who are mature, those who know their Bibles well. They know. They're afraid of those Christians, actually. They're, they're a threat to their dark and devilish kingdom. That's right. So I encourage you here today, become more of a threat to the kingdom of darkness as you are filled with the light of God's living word. Amen. Amen. Paul encourages the church in Ephesus, Ephesians 4.13, to grow in the knowledge of Christ. Why does Paul tell them to grow in the knowledge of Christ? Now he's telling, he's telling them to grow in the knowledge of Christ biblically, right? Intellectually, but even experientially. He's telling them know Jesus, know Him well, know Him biblically, and have a genuine, lasting, real, faithful relationship with the living and risen Christ. And that will be your shield. You know the ones that they cannot deceive? Those who know Jesus. Those who love Jesus and spend time with their God. Amen. And I encourage us all here today to grow in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. John chapter 10 and verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice. His voice is His word. His written word. You want to hear the voice of Jesus? Get in your Bible. He says, I know them and they follow me. And in verse 5 he says, Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from them, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Why? Because they're so familiar with the voice of the chief shepherd that when a wolf comes around and begins to whisper and yap his little mouth. We know the difference. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul says that we henceforth be no more children. He's always encouraging the church to grow up, to grow up. But yet the Bible says that we are to teach with all patience. Why? Because we are all at different levels in our spiritual growth. We're all growing and it's good. But we ought to be always growing. Always growing. Amen. He says, no more children tossed to and fro 
back and forth, vacillating, and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. He says, don't be immature. Don't go running after every preacher you see and hear on TV or on YouTube. Don't go after everything everyone is preaching and teaching because it's popular, because it's trendy, and it's the new big thing. Stick to the old road. Stick to the clear writings of the Word of God. Amen. He says, don't go. Don't run after everyone who smells like a shepherd, who smells like a sheep. Because even wolves are clothed by sheep's clothing. Amen. The Lord doesn't want us being tossed back and forth by every teaching. That's what doctrine means. Every wind of teaching. The new thing that comes up. Nor by every supposed sign and wonder. The only one we ought to be chasing is Christ. You don't see sheep following wolves. You see them following the shepherd. Amen. You don't see sheep going and wandering off at times. They do. The shepherd has to go get them. And that's why we need messages like this. But for the most part, they follow closely behind their loving shepherd. For example, there are many on YouTube video, And there's so many examples. I'm just trying to pick some of the most popular ones that I think are the most popular ones today. There are so many videos today of supposed teachers who are teaching on blood moons. Have you guys ever ran into one of those videos where they're just all about the titrat of blood moons and watch out for these blood moons in September, the Lord's coming in September and all of this foolishness? Let me let you in on something. The Bible talks about just one blood moon and it's in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. That's it. And it happens in the time of the tribulation. Any other time the Bible talks about a blood moon, it's just one blood moon. That's it. And that's going to happen in the time of the tribulation. And am I saying that these people are being deceptive? No, some of them are just gullible and naive and following the trends, making videos like everybody else. But some of them are true deceivers. Some of them are true deceivers. And listen to me. You might say, what's the big deal, Pastor? Why? Why can't they talk about blood moons? It's in the Bible. There's only one. And not only that, but it's because these are detours. These are distractions. They, they take your eyes off the ministry. They take your eyes off the people. They take your eyes off the Word. And then there you go, watching one video after another, becoming more and more fooled by those who are of the enemy. Amen. That's why it's so important. The blood moon is found in Revelation 6.12 at the opening of the sixth seal. No other blood moon matters at all. Right. Not only that, but there is a supposed miraculous oil producing Bible going around America. Has anybody seen that foolishness? Yeah. Yeah. There is no scripture that tells us to keep an eye on an oily Bible. <laughs> Instead, preachers are commanded to preach the Bible, not carry an oily Bible in a box of oil from state to state. God cares more about the open Bible than the oily Bible. Amen? Amen? God never wanted the church to go and be spectators of these, these works of darkness. God doesn't want you to be in awe of an oily Bible. He wants you to be in awe of an open Bible that preaches and talks and teaches about Him. He wants you to be amazed at Him. That's it. In a nutshell, that's what it's all about. That your eyes and your heart would be captured by the greatness and the goodness and the beauty of our God. Thank you, Lord. Yes. I told you sometimes I have to hold myself back. I just know the damage that these silly things are causing. It's a lot of damage, church. You might not see it like a big deal, but listen to me, the people around you are listening to these things, watching these things, believing these things, and flocking to these things. And under your watch, they're being deceived. 
Do not believe every spirit, referring to false prophets. For example, this can refer to false teachers, pastors, church leaders, men, women, and even false Christians in general. And there are tons of them, as I already said, on YouTube. False prophets can be anyone who claims to be a mouthpiece of God. Anyone. But here he's dealing with mainly false prophets, teachers and preachers in the church. It is referring to false prophets, but this word spirit and this, and this word spirits, uh, plural, have an even deeper meaning than just false prophet. In other words, spirit or spirits point to demonic spirits. Demonic spirits. John is saying that every person who claims to speak on God's behalf is either speaking by the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the spirit of truth, or demonic spirits, which is the spirit of error, the spirit of the world, and the spirit of Antichrist. There is no middle ground. Men who speak for God are either speaking for God or they're speaking for the devil. There is no middle ground. There is no maybe he's of God or maybe they're not of God. No, either they are or they're not. And we'll get into detail on how to spot them as we've already alluded to a few signs and symptoms that we should be looking for. Paul warned the Corinthians about possibly receiving a different spirit. This is what it's talking about. A different spirit, a different teaching, different individuals. In 2 Corinthians 11.4, it says, Because some of them were given into phony super apostles and their teachings, their doctrines of devils. Paul makes it very clear in 2 Corinthians 11, a different Jesus and a different gospel is connected to a different spirit, a demonic one. This is the reason why the prosperity gospel is so damning, because it's a different Jesus. It's a genie Jesus. It is a Jesus who wants to make you rich, wealthy, and famous. It's a Jesus who wants you perfectly healthy. Now, I'll tell you one thing, we're going to get all the good things God wants for us in heaven. But here, false preachers are making false promises in the name of the true Jesus. This is the reason why the sign and wonders movement is so damning. Because it's a different Jesus. It's a different gospel. And it's a different spirit. Jesus never said, go from one place to another and thirst and hunger for spiritual experiences and supposed miracles. He never told us to go to coliseums where there would be a gentleman who thinks he's a man of God and there would be people lined up wishing they would be healed and they never are. He's taking their money. He doesn't preach Christ. He doesn't teach the word of God. He's not a man of God. And that's it. Why do I get so serious about this? Because it's a serious matter. It's a serious matter. It's like this. Every preacher or person who claims to speak truth is either the Lord's mouthpiece or the devil's mouthpiece. Just as God has his servants and ministers, Satan has his servants and ministers as well. And at times, it's very hard to distinguish them at times, depending on where you are spiritually, because of their ability to disguise themselves. They're very much like chameleons. They know how to fit in. They're camouflage. You gotta watch them. A young man by the name of Patrick a few months ago came into the church and he began to try to get to know a few people uh, and uh, Brother James looked into his background. He found a few videos that he, where he's teaching Hebrew Roots Movement and so I looked into it more, watched some of his videos, had a, a conversation with him. He also believed that the Holy Spirit was a woman, right? And so as soon as I found out that this young man was a false teacher, I said, you can no longer come to this church. Now, if he was an individual who wasn't a teacher, we would have pulled him under our wings and corrected him. But this guy wanted nothing to do with it. He is a teacher of false and devilish doctrines, and he had to leave. Why? Because he was after you. He wanted you to conform from what you know of the Word of God into his false teachings. That was his goal. 
So we have to be aware. We have to be alert. Amen? Amen. Always. Always awake, always alert. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13 and 14 says, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. That was his name before he was Satan, by the way, Lucifer. They get their little dirty tricks from the devil himself. Therefore, it is no great thing, it's no surprise, if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. In other words, he's saying, listen, they're going to come into the churches. They'll be in the church. They will be, quote unquote, preachers of righteousness. They will, quote unquote, preach Jesus Christ. But it's all fault. It's all fake. They are messengers and ministers of the devil himself. That's what he's saying. And the spirit of the coming Antichrist, again, is none other than Satan's spirit. They are demonic spirits that work in the lives of devilish preachers. He says, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. In other words, we have a responsibility as children of God, as disciples of Jesus Christ, as students of the Bible, to test the spirits, whether they are of God. You are little testers. That's what you are. We test spirits by the word of God. That's how you do it. How do we know who is of God and who isn't of God? Well, take what they say, compare it to the Word, and you'll have your answer quickly. The Bible is our magnifying glass, church. John says, he who knows God hears us. Did you catch that? He who knows God hears us, he says. He who is not of God does not hear us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This is the key. This is the key to distinguish a devilish preacher. Listen, before the Bible was canonized and complete like it is today, you can't add to it anymore. It is done. It is closed. The apostles, in a, in a sense, like John and Paul and some of the disciples that were used by the Holy Spirit to write the scriptures, these were, in a sense, human Bibles as they were led by the Holy Spirit to teach and to write. That's the reason why he said, look, if anybody comes into the church and they don't believe us, the apostles, those who wrote the Bible, they don't believe this. They don't believe us. They're not of God, plain and simple. Amen? Amen. And so John made it very easy for the church to distinguish a devilish preacher. Which one's a devilish preacher? Those who don't like John. Those who don't like Paul. Those who don't like Jude. Those who don't like Peter. Those who don't like this book. And the writers of this book. As they were moved by the Holy Spirit. He's telling them, listen, if they're not listening to us, they're not of us. So the test at that time was if you agreed with the apostles, you were genuine. If you didn't, you were a fraud. Today is the same way. If you agree with the Bible, you are genuine. If you disagree with the Bible, you are a fraud. That's what it means to be anti-Christ. That's what it means to be against Jesus. It's to be against His Word. It's to have something else in place of His Word. Like signs and miracles and the love of money and so on. Amen. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says that the new believers continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrines. There it is. That's where it's at. Steadfastly continuing in the word of God, their writings, the apostles' teachings, as they were given revelation by God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13, it says, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, listen, because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, Paul says, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. 
How important is it that we obey God's word? How important is it that we study God's word? How important is it that we hear the word of God being preached and taught? Well, it'll save your soul if you're unsaved. And it'll make you strong and effective for the kingdom if you are saved. It's effective. It does something to you. Right now, the spirit of God through the word of God is doing something to you. It is effective. It is living. It is powerful. It shapes us, molds us, gives us wisdom. So we are to test their words. How do you know a devilish preacher from a godly preacher? You test their words. We will discover a devilish preacher or individuals of all kinds by their words, by what they say. Does what they say and how they live line up with the Bible? That's the question you ought to always ask, no matter who it is that you are listening to, including myself. Do they line up with the Apostles' writings? Does what they say line up with the book of Peter? Does it line up with the book of Jude? Does it line up with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Know your Bible. Compare their words with the word. So you do it. You compare their words with the word, the written word, and the person of Jesus Christ, the living word. Jesus says you will know them by their fruits. You will know them by their fruits, the fruit of their lips and the fruit of their lives. You give ear to what they say, and you give eyes to their ways, and that will tell you who they are. Makes it very simple. Makes it very simple for us to understand who's who. And the question you always ask, are they biblical? Are they biblical? Do they teach what Jesus taught, and do they live the life of Jesus? Not perfectly, but it's got to be there. Job chapter 34 and verse 3 says, For the ear tests the words like the tongue tests food. This is the reason why Jesus says, He that has ears, let him hear. He is saying, He that has an ear for the word of God, He that has their ears trained by the word and the spirit of God, let them hear. He says here, for the ear test words. So what do we do? We test their words. We use these precious gifts of God. Sometimes they're really big. Sometimes they're not. <laughs> but they're very valuable to us. Some of you are like, where'd that come from? The point is, <laughs> by the way, this is the duty again of every believer. 1 Corinthians 14, 29 says this. Let two or three prophesy or prophets speak, that is preach, and let the others judge. I'm up here preaching, speaking. You are judging. You are testing me right now. And anybody else who comes up here to do the same thing, you test them. You judge them. Are they in line with this book? That's how you do it. Whether it's an individual at a pulpit or it's an individual on the corner of the street or one on YouTube. It doesn't matter where they are. They claim to be mouthpieces of God. Judge their words. Amen. Now, it's the duty of all of us. It's the responsibility of all of us. But it's especially the duty of pastors and leaders of the church, those who teach the Bible. It is mainly their job. We know that because Acts chapter 20 makes it very, very clear. The Bereans... They're so popular and famous, these Bereans. They're so loved and always mentioned. The Bereans were known and commended for examining the teachings of Paul. Acts chapter 17 and verse 11 says, These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica. <laughs> in other words, he was going from one place to another, and there were certain individuals who really paid attention. It says, in that they received the word of God with readiness. They were eager. 
and search the scriptures daily. They weren't lazy. They weren't gullible. It says to find out whether these things were true. If Paul, the greatest preacher of all time besides Jesus Christ, was tested by the people, how much more not myself and every other man in line to preach. I don't care how big a man's ministry is, how small a man's ministry is, every man must be tested. People test things all the time. You and I both know very well that testing things is very, very important. What do we do when we want a vehicle? We want a car. We test drive it. Why? Because we want to make sure we don't get a lemon. Nobody wants to be spending thousands of dollars on a car that doesn't work. They test it. They take the time to test it so they don't lose out. What else do people test? People test metals. Is this necklace real gold? Is it real silver? Is that diamond a real diamond? Is it a cubic zirconia? Because nobody wants to be wearing that, right? People are testing things all the time. You go to the store, you test the clothing. You walk yourself in that little fitting room and you try it on before you buy it. Why? Because you don't want to go back and have to take it back, right? Yeah. You don't want to lose out is my point. That's the reason why you test everything. So I'm saying this. If it's important to test material things that have no eternal value, how much more is it important to test men who can damn and cripple your soul? Amen. That's what I'm saying. We spend time testing things that don't really matter. Spend time in the Word and spend time testing those who speak on behalf of God. Amen. I performed an experiment with Damien, my son, yesterday. He was so happy about it. He is a Dr. Pepper lover. He's been drinking Dr. Pepper since the bottle and the sippy cup. <clears throat> So I, I did a little experiment to see if he's a true Dr. Pepper lover, if he can recognize the real from the fake. And so I went to buy a, the, the real brand, the genuine brand, Dr. Pepper, then I went to go buy a knockoff, Dr. Dynamite. And what I did was I poured these two, two liters uh, into two different cups, but I had him blindfolded first, so he had no idea what was going on. And I said, okay, Damien, Let's see how familiar you really are with Dr. Pepper, right? And I put them both before him. He takes a drink of the fake one first. Took one little sip. He says, that's fake. <laughs> that, 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 that was it. He even took off the thing and like dropped the mic. He was done. Back to Fortnite. Like, well, what is this all about? You're testing me, you know. And so <laughs> that's exactly what he did. Fake, pff, done. What's my point? My point is this, just as Damon was familiar with the true Dr. Pepper, he was able to distinguish the fake Dr. Pepper. In the same way, when you are familiar with the teachings of the Word of God, you can distinguish the fake quickly, quickly. It was so much fun doing it too, but it was, it was so quick. It was like, what? I just spent $2 on that thing. <laughs> <laughs> and it was so funny too because the other cup, the one with the real Dr. Pepper, he grabs it and goes to his room. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> Job says, we test words with our ears like we taste food and flavors with our taste buds. God didn't give you those ears for nothing. Not just so you can put little uh, pretty earrings on. No, 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 no. They were used to listen, to test, to judge the words of men. Devilish preachers don't have a high regard for the exposition of the Word of God. This is another sign. Amen. Andy Stanley recently said that we ought to unhitch ourselves from the Old Testament. Right. One of the most foolish things I've heard in the year 2019. Yes. Why? Because the Old Testament is the foundation of the New Testament. The Old Testament is the floor. The New Testament are the walls, 
the roof and the windows. Without the Old Testament, you're building on sand. By the way, you get rid of the Old Testament, you get rid of Genesis. Where do we come from? I don't know. Maybe monkeys, maybe stardust. We don't have Genesis anymore. We need all of the Word of God. He's got one of the biggest churches today. But he is, he, he's becoming more and more dangerous, church. And I say that with all sincerity and love towards even him. I, I love him. I, I love these men. I hope that God has mercy on them and, and that he reaches them before they hit the flames of eternal hell. I mean that. Now, they don't want to teach it with gentle care and precision. You see, this is another sign. When individuals have the Bible in their hand and they're peddling it, they're, 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 ha they're more happy about their powerless illustrations than they are the exposition or the explanation of God's Word. When, when men are too quick to read a verse and they're excited about their illustration and their little video and, and, and all these little trinkets that they bring up, there's a problem. There's a problem. He is not trembling at the Word of God. He doesn't want to expound it. Let's go back at it. Let's dissect it. Let's talk about it. Let's connect this verse with another verse here. Let's do some connecting of the dots here today. Why? Because God's word deserves that esteem and respect. And you deserve to really know the word of God. Right? So men who don't teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book, who don't expound the word of God... I question them. Now, am I saying there's no room for topical preaching? Yes, there is, but they ought to be expositional always. We explain what we teach always. I am not more excited about my illustrations than I am the Word of God. Sonny's thoughts, Sonny's ideas, Sonny's stories don't compare with the living Word of God. What you need is God, not me. Amen. And that's just the way of it. I'm just a clay pot. He is the treasure. He is the absolute treasure. Amen, Brother James. And I know Albert agrees to that too. We are servants of Jesus Christ. His word is everything. Ay, ay, ay. In verse 2, John says, By this you will know the Spirit of God. I just want to go back just to make sure there's no confusion. There are going to be some good preachers and some men of God who don't necessarily expound the scriptures like they should, but sometimes it's out of ignorance. Some men are just, they don't take their job seriously. They're, they're too busy, they're too distracted, and they'll just come, and, and they love the people and stuff. And I've seen that with some of the brothers, even in town. I mean, I've told pastors, hey, you should really teach the word expositionally. Your, your, your people aren't being fed. I just, I tell people, they don't like it when they hear it. You know, they get mad at me, but I don't care. I care about the sheep of God. I care about the glory of God. I care about the word of God. Without this, we have nothing. We literally have nothing at all. Amen? This is how God has revealed himself. So, well, every man will stand before God and they will give an account. And the Bible says, let there not be many teachers because for them will be the greater judgment. In verse 2, John says, By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is of God. I've shared this with you time and time again because we're in the same book for a very long time now, by the way. Um, at that time, there were the Gnostics. Uh, these were individuals that claimed to have higher knowledge than the apostles. And they would say, no, 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 no. Jesus didn't come in the flesh. He's not human, he's spirit. And some of the individuals in the church, instead of listening to John, the walking Bible, they listened to these Gnostics and were deceived. And so this is the reason why John continues to bring this up. Jesus Christ is man and Jesus Christ is God. He is the Son of God because he came from heaven. He is the Son of man because he came from Mary. He is fully man and he is fully God. You take away his divinity, you take away his humanity, and you have a different Jesus. Amen. One that cannot save your soul. Amen? Amen? And so he's, he's bringing this aspect about Jesus, but this isn't the only test. 
Because you and I might read this and say, oh, if every person just says that Jesus came in the flesh, they're of God. And they could do everything else and say anything else. Absolutely not. That is just one test of many. There's just one. At this time, that's what they were dealing with. So John brought it up. They denied the humanity of Jesus. Again, this is just one test in regards to what people believe and teach about Jesus. Another test of a devilish preacher or individual is that they will deny some aspect of who Jesus is. And if they don't deny some aspect of who Jesus is, they will do this. They will ignore it and they will avoid it and they won't teach it. Any man who avoids the full Jesus, his person, work, and teachings is a devil. And if he's not, he's a very disrespectful, prideful, immature preacher. He's too clever. He's too smart. No, no, no. no. Give me the whole Christ. Yeah. We are to believe that Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. Any man who denies the Trinity does not have Christ. They don't know Him. We must believe that He is God. We must believe that He is man. We must believe that He was born of a virgin. We must believe that He is the only way to heaven. Not like Joe Osteen who believes that there are many ways to Christ. He's got an ecumenical Jesus. That's the kind of Jesus that shares his throne and his deity with other false religious figures and idols. No, 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 no. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no one goes to the Father but by me. Joe Osteen has another Jesus. A false Jesus. We must believe that he died for our sins and rose again bodily. Yes, bodily. He was glorified. Anyone who denies or omits biblical accounts of Jesus again is a wolf. I'm looking for men to preach him. To preach Jesus. I don't care about your house. I don't care about your stories. I don't care about your ministry. I don't care about your book. I don't care about what you have or what you can do, how clever you are or how golden your tongue is. I want to hear about Jesus. That's it. Now, if they preach Christ with all their hearts and God has blessed their ministry and different things, then more power to them more glory to Christ. Amen? Amen? But it's all about Jesus, church. It's all about Jesus. It just is. This whole book is about Him. It is Him in the sense that He is the Word, the living Word. <laughs> this is, it's all about Christ. Amen? Amen? Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Don't ever come for any other reason to this church, but that Jesus Christ is to be glorified and worshipped and heard through his little clay pots. <laughs> True preachers make much of Jesus, his person, work, and teachings. They make much of Jesus, his person, work, and teachings. Uh, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, Jesus makes it very clear. It's the same command for every preacher. Every preacher just get in line and do what Jesus told you to do, right? And he says this, Go into all the world, starting where you're planted. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe, that is, obey everything that I have taught you. That is the job and duty of every preacher. If a man isn't doing that, he is not a true preacher. He might be something else, but he's not a preacher. He might be a comedian. He might be an entertainer. He might be a life coach, but he is not a preacher. If men aren't teaching Jesus, they are not men of God. And I want you to remember this. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are Jesus' teaching when he was in the flesh. The rest of the epistles, the rest of the uh, books in the Bible, they are the commentary to what Jesus has taught. And it's the Holy Spirit that gave these men revelation 
of what Jesus said in a deeper understanding. So as I'm teaching 1 John, I'm teaching Jesus' teachings. Does that make sense? True spirit-filled men will make much of Jesus. John chapter 16 and verse 14, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and give it to you. Those who are truly spirit-filled by God will make much of Jesus Christ. Today, many preachers make much of many things. They make much of money, wealth. They make much of health. They make much of worldly success. They make much of comfort. They make much of talents and giftings. They make much of dreams and visions and prophecies. They make much of signs and wonders and spiritual experiences. They make much of books and music and ministry accomplishments, including themselves instead of Jesus. This is Antichrist. It's all these things in place of Jesus. That is the work of the devil. Anytime anybody leaves the house of God, they ought to have the word in their hearts. If they have anything else going out of this place, it's another Jesus. Amen. Paul says, for we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. Ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I mean, Paul makes himself very low. It's all about Jesus. He is Lord. We're not that important. We came to wash your feet. Right? Don't make superstars of us. Don't worship us. Don't, don't esteem us in a way that is unhealthy. We, we're just slaves. We're your servants. We're here to care for you. We're here to teach you. We're here to love you. We're here to pray for you. That's it. Amen. We're not here for men's admirations. We're not here for men's praise. We are here for the glory and the honor of Jesus Christ alone. We preach Christ. That's what that means. We point people's eyes and hearts to Jesus, not ourselves and not anyone else in this place. Jesus is the main event always. In verse 5, John also says that they are of the world. Therefore, they speak as of the world, and the world hears them. That's another clue. They're worldly. One commentator says of this verse and devilish preachers, it's worldly men speaking to worldly people about worldly things. That's a devilish preacher. He can't preach Christ because he doesn't have the spirit of Christ. And he won't preach Christ because in his heart he hates Christ. And he loves himself above Christ. Those are devilish preachers. I question any Christian who is invited to appear on secular shows such as Oprah Winfrey or Alan DeGeneres. I question I question them if they're embraced by the world. Because Luke chapter 6 and verse 26 says this, Woe, that is cursed, woe to you when everyone speaks well of you. For that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. False prophets are loved and accepted by the world. Now if Oprah invited a Paul Washer and she became angry and had to edit everything out, then I would say, right on, Paul. But if somebody like T.D. Jakes or Carl Lentz or some quote-unquote Christian artist goes on these shows and they're praised by these people of the world who deny Christ, those quote-unquote Christians are in danger. At the very least, they're compromising at the worst, they are ministers of the devil disguising themselves as Christians. Straight up. Amen. Well, it's getting pretty serious. <laughs> John 15, 18 to 21, Jesus told his disciples, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, 
it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Again, I weary of quote-unquote Christian artists who receive secular awards like Grammys. I'll tell you why. Because how is it possible that Jesus Christ was murdered for his message and these individuals are awarded for their message? Ah, oh, something's a bit fishy. Something's fishy. Because when you preach the correct Jesus and you preach his teachings, worldly men will become indignant and angry. Give me that back. I'm going to give it to some worldly artists instead. Do you hear me? And sometimes the world will award true Christians. They will applaud them, but it's all a deceptive tactic. If we can get the church to watch them and our worldly shows and our worldly artists and all of this stuff, then we can somehow hook them in. And just how we hook their artists, we'll hook them in too. And this happens all the time. Just the other day I heard Caleb say that a rapper by the name of Chance the Rapper is a Christian. And now I know they could have said it out of pure ignorance, but listen, it's not acceptable. It's not our fault you're ignorant. Don't be telling us that these secular artists who are smoking weed, doing drugs, cussing, and, and disrespecting God left and right are Christian artists. Don't tell us that. Do your research. Be a Berean. Don't hurt the church. Now, I'm not saying that they don't have good music to listen to and enjoy. We do. But what I'm saying is this. Everyone, even parachurch ministries, everyone has to test the spirits, has to know what they're pumping out. And it's got to be the truth. Everyone. It's everyone's job. If you're a disciple of Jesus, you're a defender of the faith, whether you like it or not. Now, how dangerous you are is up to you. Because it's up to how much time you spend in the Word of God and in prayer. And when I mean by dangerous, I mean dangerous to, to the enemy. How, how effective you are to the unbeliever and how bright you are is also up to you. The Lord says, you draw near to me and I will draw near to you. That's a promise. Lastly, again, they speak of the world and the world hears them. When they speak, the world likes it. I agree with that. That doesn't bother me one bit. I like you. You want an extra cup of coffee, maybe some lemonade, some tea. You're not offensive. You're not like those other Christians, or those who are uptight and always want to defend the Bible. We like you. You're different. You dress like us, act like us, carry yourself just like us. We like you. Stay here. That's what they say. That's what they say to these individuals. When it says that they speak of the world and the world hears them, automatically John wants you to remember 1 John chapter 2 and verse 16. They speak of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are devilish preachers. They're just like the devil. How so? When Satan, quote unquote, preached to Jesus while he was being tempted, he says, I can make you rich and famous. I can make you the king of all the kingdoms. That's what you hear Joel Osteen say in his clever ways. That's what you hear Stephen Furtick say in his clever ways. That's what you hear Judah Smith say in his clever ways. That's what you hear Joseph Prince say in his clever ways. That's what you hear Joyce Meyer say in her clever way. That's what you hear Benny Hinn say in his clever ways. It's up to you to do your own homework. But I'll tell you one thing. I have tested, I have tried, and many of them are guilty. I know some of you might be thinking, seriously, that person, I kind of like him. It's between you and the Lord. I'm just telling it like it is, church. They preach the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's what they preach. That's their message. But they tag the name of Jesus to it to make it a religious message. Oh, it's still the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Materialistic. Self-power. Self-help. 
you're great, you're awesome, you're good, right? And they tag the name of Jesus to it. Just so that way you and I can be like, oh yeah, of course, they're a Christian. We're not falling for a church. 2 Peter 2.19 says, Of devilish preachers, while they promote liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. Oh, they preach a big game. They use illustrations of the Old Testament. They'll talk about David. They'll, they'll talk about Joshua. They'll talk about these victorious individuals of the Old Testament. They'll say, you can be like them. But in their heart, they are still bound to their greed. They're still bound to their self-love. They're still bound to the love of the, the lust of the flesh, the, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. They are corrupt corrupt and they corrupt those they teach that's the way it works and that's why there are so many anemic powerless Christians in America today because of that can I get an amen, amen. give God praise in this house today